Hi, my name's Gareth Jones, Managing Director of Income Training and Business Services. I'm here with my colleague, Paul Hodgetts, who's a Senior Business Development Manager. We are about to introduce the 2023 Skills Barometer. We take the temperature by questioning and surveying our clients in the engineering manufacturing sector to identify the barriers to engagement, but also the positives and the further projection of what's happening around skills within our sector. Okay, in today's discussion, we've identified four key areas that we want to discuss. They are about reshoring, the use of higher education and furthering technical skills, the um, Industry 4.0 digitisation versus renewables and electrification, and also around the future for apprenticeships and modular training. So we've noticed that 50% of companies are not engaging or increasing their training budgets. And you know, it's about engaging the disengaged. There's still a large percentage of companies actually, they don't want to actually grow their training budgets or invest. They're, yeah. they're happy keeping it as standard, earning no succession planning or developing for the future. Yeah, I'd agree. And I think more companies than ever are going down like, the technical upskilling route, but then the ones who aren't having a training budget is they haven't got one not even reduced it, they haven't got a training budget, they haven't prioritised training and, and mandatory training and upskilling as part of their development for the future. So, so in the last 12 months, Paul, we, we've seen a 48% <coughs> increase in leadership and management training requirements. Yeah. And that's even above engineering, manufacturing and health and safety. I mean, from the clients that you're seeing, what do you, what do you think that is? I think a couple of reasons. We've seen that on the, on the ground from, from a sales point of view, that people wanting to do leadership management training at all levels, two, three and five. I think the first reason is, I think, is people in those positions during COVID have moved on. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lack of supervisors, managers who've now chosen to retire or go into different fields. And they're trying to, businesses are trying to upskill their current people to give them the skills needed to manage and supervise. And the, the second thing is, I think you've got an influx of people into businesses who are, who are younger and aiming for those positions. Yeah. And some of the larger organisations and SMEs are looking to reward those people. So an interesting point there then, <clears throat> if, if they've identified leadership and management as an increase of a 48%, are you actually seeing that in conversion rates when you're working with companies? Are we seeing more engagement into those type of programmes? We are, but, but not using um, levy training packages anymore. We're seeing it more through short, targeted upskilling programmes. Yeah, modular. So is that very targeted around niche subjects? Or let, so, so let's say it might be managing budgets, strategy development, or, or is it a case of still doing like eight to 10 days certificate diplomas? Yeah, the second one. Yeah, okay. still, still, they often come out wanting a, a qualification as well as the competence and new skills. So yeah, that modular training where they achieve, achieve the certificates and the quals. So on a monthly basis, when you and the team are working with industry, Paul, we have seen a shift change in the way people and organisations want their training delivered. Um, we've identified that in the barometer. What are they? The big shift change is, is companies and individuals wanting modular training, shorter, more impactful courses and qualifications. That are very specific against Specific a against the training need and, and the company need. And getting the individuals the skills and knowledge over a shorter period of time because because of the, the barriers of having to release people yeah shop floor demands companies operating leaner they're leaner than they were three or four years ago so it's quite interesting with that then because all the funding strategies that are due to go live that we've bidded for is all about modular delivery and being able to get unitized accreditation so over a period of time you can build level. up to a, a bigger qualification essentially yeah yeah i think that apprenticeships have always been the first way to look at it with using the levy and using yeah. the co-investment to get funding opportunities. There's a lot of input into those aren't there? Yeah. There's a lot of resource demand. But just because it's funded it, they're still having to release them which is costing the company money. Yeah yeah. So The, the other key point that I found really interesting was organisations are um, struggling to identify their training needs in the first place. So yeah. that says to me that the companies haven't got necessarily got the resource or the know-how to skills audit their workforce, to know the skills, but also the demographics, etc., and what's going to be needed for 
today's sustainability and tomorrow's growth. So, what do you think? I think we can yeah, support that with. I think that one of the you know the second finding wasn't it trying to find identify the right training courses to marry up with the needs of the individuals and the businesses. I think that's exactly where we can come in as an organisation because it's trying to put out the catalogue and the menu that can help support them with the training needs for the individuals. Yeah. And the other important thing is to like the skills uh, the training officer contracts that we're about to relaunch this year when we can yeah. go in and do the skills audits for an organisation and leave them with the audit if you like or we can pick it up and work with them on a monthly basis to actually start bring it to life. Yeah, to install yeah. install their training plan. So companies have obviously really seen at the moment that we've seen a 77% 77 up this from last year in organisations wanting to engage in taking on an apprentice and we've got that commitment this year. We've seen that, we've already had X amount of starts already recruited for over in Telford. All the jobs are live for Aldridge at the moment. Yeah. I think industry's woken up to the fact of you've got to grow your own. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, this year already, we've just come to the end of quarter two and the vacancies and vacancies that have already been filled are showing that increase in people want to get in apprenticeships. The other thing is there's also that demand from the other side of the fence which is learners wanting to get back into apprenticeships and then being a really viable attractive option yeah. for their school leavers or further development. Yeah. It's pleasing to see because it's not a short term fix, it is a medium to long term fix but yeah. at least the note's been um, identified and, and actions been taken finally early as well this yeah. year it seems like yeah. companies are getting their getting their ducks in a row getting the vacancies live and that gives you the, the best chance of picking the talent doesn't it yeah Um, so we surveyed the industrial population about their barriers to engaging in apprenticeships as well and it was quite jaw-dropping to see that 48% of them said that they've got no barriers to engagement which was really pleasing, makes everybody's life a, a lot more easier. Yeah. But the next one down was the in-house infrastructure and I think that's really aligned to being able to allow people off the shop floor. But not only that, if you've got a four-year engineering manufacturing apprenticeship is you know the cooks tour around the factory to get their competence and get a feel for the overall business and the business functions um but also having the individuals to support them yeah through their learning journey inside the companies yeah i think now that's more than ever i think people want to be responsible employers and they don't want to just take on apprentices and feel they're going to be left especially with the standards where you've got that work-based learning element where you need a manager and a mentor to not hold their hand, but pass down knowledge, support them through it. Um, and employers want to have that in place. They want to feel they've got opportunities to give time and support yeah. to learners if they're going to take someone on, which is good. And I think that's where we come in, because we can, we can support companies by giving them the skills to mentor or coach or yeah. manage people. And another good one that was pleasing not to see on there as well, or a very low percentage, was not having access to the right apprenticeship programme or apprenticeship standard, yeah. and not having access to the right provision. So that means that the provision is out there, the standards have been created for all the different job functions now, which does make it more accessible to, for it to be engaged in. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. And people, the organisations know what they are as well which is, I know we come in as a kind of consultation and, and advice organisation, but companies are well equipped now with knowing what standards there are yeah. that fit the needs of their business. And it was also a bit like the digital apprenticeship service that came when that had to be got onto every employer out there. You know, there's been a lot of hard work done over the last six years by providers uh, and industry to get these standards live, but also learning new processes and systems. That's with actually delivering the training. It's the backroom administration. Yeah. Um, which, and I think for micro businesses, SMEs, that, that haven't necessarily got a dedicated person to, to do that. Yeah. That's again, we can, that's where we've been helpful with support and companies with that. So the, the, there's been big advancements now with 82% of employers saying that they, they, they give the opportunity to their learners to go into higher education, which is a 17% uplift on 2022. So it's all okay. heading in the right direction. 
But I really think that's reflective of the skills and the technical capabilities that organisations need now, especially with the skills drain. There's, we, as we'll see later on as well, there's a lot of money being spent on technology with dual process machine tools, automation, process lines and so on, which gives you a different need. So an individual now will be running high tech machinery and more of them in a cell. Um, and, and engineering projects. Uh, I think maybe the other thing around it as well is the seamless pathway from apprenticeship through to degree apprenticeship now, and that's part of that journey mm. has become more seamless. Yeah, and um, I think c companies companies are accepting that that's going to be the length of time to get people into the yeah. right skills. Yeah. I well, think when you're trying to cut corners, cut corners, three years done, and, and they finish your apprenticeship, and they expect a finished product and I think people are getting used to the idea that there, there is these apprenticeships and training courses and wanting to go on that journey with a learner that they're going to have to keep maybe a day or a week out of the business while they develop the tools to come back into the business to... Interesting. And do you think, because a lot of people surveyed are our clients, but there's yeah. also a large number that aren't our clients at the minute as well, so these statistics are varied. Would you think it's made an impact us developing our higher educational offer and getting that message out to our clients as well? 100%, yeah. I think companies and learners, hand in hand, you've got, you've got learners coming through who are ambitious, who want to develop and not yeah. stop when they've finished level three qualifications. And then you've got companies, like you say, the skills gaps and skills drains where they need people to have those skills yeah. to fill some of the gaps within, in the, within the businesses to be future leaders or yeah. high-end high -end operators. Yeah. Well, it's nice that there's a break point as well now. So after you're a competent machinist, tool maker, product design, tech support, you can stop there if you wish. Yeah. Or you can carry on, which is obviously funded as well if you do it as part of the apprenticeship or pay commercially for. Yeah. And again, going back to the modular piece, this is where we're open to plug a gap because we'll be able to deliver modular units funded. So it can be very targeted. Tar yeah. Um, so you can, there's, there's eight modules in an HNC, for instance. You can drop on and do the one module that's going to be contributed to all the, the, the well, whole. I think we saw the success of that last year with those 10 week level four programs. Yeah, and the in work skills pilot. Yeah, the machining, the quality and assurance and the robotics, very well received by industry yeah. to give that targeted upskilling. So some of the feedback of companies, are they looking to upskill or reskill some of their staff? And 45% said no, they haven't offered um, their, their members of staff some training. Uh, which I think, as you said, it contradicts itself a little bit. So yeah, do you want to elaborate on that? Well, yeah, well, modular training, as we all know, is increasing and increasing because of the time demands on staff and organisations. But then there's still nearly 50% of industry not offering upskilling or reskilling opportunities to their staff. Mm -hmm. And that's where we've got to penetrate, engaging the disengaged. You know, this is about the sustainability and growth of UK manufacturing and engineering. And we want to ensure that it stays here for the long term. So when you know when you bring in reshoring, we need to instigate and set the environment for these organisations to play. Like tri-party agreements, the government need to set the playing field, industry need to engage and the providers need to be on the ball to work with industry to give them what they want. 75% of uh, companies have indicated that they're concerned about their skills and, uh, and individuals retiring this oh, yeah. year. And given the fact of, of COVID and, and fast forwarding some of those plans for people, getting to 50, 60 and wanting to change lifestyles or do something different. Well, the skills gap got ex exasperated, didn't we? we? We already know we're now covering our ground when we're talking about the late 90s, early noughties and the massive skills gap that was generated because of the lack of focus on apprenticeships and engineering manufacturing. But the pandemic's exasperated that now. And, you know, we've got to quench that thirst, really. We've got to start taking action. And I think we've identified that the figures are matching this up. They are taking action. Yeah, we've. Uh, the same percentage of companies saying, yeah, we want to take apprentices this year, that's good, yeah. because they're doing something about it, they leave it a couple of years, it's too late, the well, gaps are there. Well, instead of that apprentice taking four to six years to add value, full value, yeah. they're going to be taking six to eight years because they're starting later and later. And these people retiring are the exact ones who can mentor and pass the knowledge down the, down the food chain, isn't it? Yeah. So. 
good one to feed back to then though as well about the mentoring programs and having the in-house infrastructure. So if these individuals are retiring, can't you actually reskill them to add value in a different way to your business? So yeah. instead of working on the shop floor as a machine store operative, whatever that may be, ask them to come back in a different role, maybe part-time, and give them a different skill set to nurture the skills and talent in your business. Yeah. So income as a training provider, we're obviously always looking at the next steps of the developing markets and sectors and what we're going to have to develop to be able to service those markets and yeah. sectors. And it was interesting to see in the barometer, the digitisation and industry four is still a, a bigger focus than what renewables and electrification is. Obviously, the renewables and electrification are still on the way up, yeah, yeah. as where we can see like where industry for digitization fits now. Yeah. It's been coming along for a good few years. I mean, well, what would be your examples of seeing that? Or? We think you can see it close to home. You can see it with an income digitizing and, and putting an inbuilt CRM that's made to suit us. Our fingers on the pulse with what's happening in the business in, in every in every department. Identifying data at your fingertips yeah. to be able to manoeuvre your business. You can react quickly, you can be agile as a business, be flexible as a business. And I, I see that as I'm out in the field, I see that all the time, either digitising or automation and seeing companies invest not only in the infrastructure but then with the skills to work that infrastructure. Um, and it, it, it's an ever-changing landscape and, yeah. and the West Midlands has been good at doing that in recent years yeah but it's filtering down the chain as well some micros and smes you know whether it be accounting packages erp systems you know you, you can now look at arm and see what machines working how hard it's working um and what temperature uh, is in the uh, in, in the workshop yeah, yeah. exactly and it's all important stuff to ensure that you're sustainable and, and, and making profit a much clearer picture on your business so that was very interesting to see yeah we're still waiting for these emerging markets of electrification and renewables to come through So the UK predominantly has always been behind Europe uh, historically about investing in new technology, automation, yeah. new equipment. You know, as long as the press is going up and down and there's pound shillings and pence being made, it, it makes no loss if it can be done quicker, faster, smarter. Yeah. But aligned with the increase in technical capabilities of staff and higher education, we have seen a 70% increase uh, during the barometer of companies wanting, uh, they are engaging in purchasing new technology for, for that very reason. And that is because the skill base doesn't exist. So they're having to look at other options to sort of replace the skill base. Okay. So, you know, as I highlighted earlier, instead of having one person running a cell of three axis lathes, you might have one person running a cell of um, three or four dual process machine tools with automation there which you know has got the, the quality the precision um, and, and the less time change over so recently we launched our collaboration with brand Air, launching the precision tool academy where, yeah. where we're sat today uh, running two programs uh, results of the barometer Said there was an appetite from from companies yeah. within the West Midlands who would would like to collaborate on on similar ventures, maybe not at the same stage as this one, but I think that's fantastic to see that companies want to partner with training providers like ourselves to develop programs and skills to fit their organisations. Yeah, and, and you hit the nail on the head. Poor collaboration is is a wide spectrum, and it looks different for every individual partner collaboration, strategic partner collaboration, doesn't it? So when you look at the tool room here, yeah. there's been a, it's gone on for years. There's been a lot of investment in curriculum, equipment, processes, systems to be able to get both of those products to market. Then you look at the Gestamp partnership which is a facility on their site just to, to, to service their process engineers to, to, well, the needs are different because they wanted to ensure more attraction and retention of operatives and staff. Yeah. So that was a different need. And then, you know, over the years, we've formed partnerships with different organisations to open training facilities, write new programmes, standards, etc. And we only exist because industry exists. And exactly that. having That's industry key. shape what we deliver to fit what industry yeah. wants is is a massive help to us. 
Yeah. And, and our doors are open, aren't they? Yeah. And I think every provider should have that collaboration with industry. We was on about earlier about the tri-party agreement with government, industry and a provider. Yeah, you know, the, the more niche specific um, training programs that we can deliver like this yeah. is the better for us. Yeah. So I'm reshoring is a massive piece for the UK post pandemic. You know, we, we all thought, wow, look what we can build and make at home. And we thought, well, hang on, this is going to make us stand up and we realise really we need to do more on UK shores. And the statistic that came out, I actually thought it was going to be flip reverse. 70% mm. of companies are not engaging or can't actually reshore the work from abroad. Uh, so that means 30%. I thought there was 70% would be reshoring work back to the UK. Mm. I mean, what, why do you think that is, Paul? Why do you think that people, like organisations are still struggling to reshore product back to the UK? There's a, there's a host of things, I would say, from being out and about. I think one of the, the, the two main things, skills gaps, that we, we haven't got the skills to be able to compete on price and lead times and... Well, let's take tool making, for instance. Yeah. There's a lot of tool making went abroad to China over a period of time. And, you know, there was questions about the quality of the tooling that was being made. Organisations were still doing it out there, bringing it back and re-manipulating the tool to actually get it working because it was still more productive than building it on UK shores. There is some resurgence to actually bring that back, although quality is improved now. But, you know, the, the legalities of working, you know, cross countries after yeah. post-Brexit now and yeah, the barriers and the knowledge to be able to do that, like you say, post-Brexit, companies are fishing in the dark sometimes because they haven't got the resource to be able to tick off what needs to be ticked off to do business up yeah. across the water. You know, we hope to see a resurgence of it in coming years, don't we, with, with the reshoring, as was discussed yeah. during COVID, the promises made and... Yeah, you know, the influences have still come back to be able to, to grow your business, you're still having that skill set. And I think this is one of the important things to remember for UK and British engineering manufacturing. Once you give an element up of your specific niche and it goes, it's very hard to be able to redevelop that intellectual property back into your business to start delivering these engineering processes again. So like your press shops with tool rooms, machine shops, etc. Once it's gone, it's very difficult to get back. To bring it back. And I think the, the, the other key point around this as well is um, there's a lot of UK industry at the moment that don't look at succession planning. Small owner managed businesses, um, you know, they're, they're, they're okay, they're doing very well at the top, maybe operatives not so good at the bottom. Yeah. And then as soon as they're ready to retire, there's no succession plan, the doors are shut, everybody's made redundant, that product now goes abroad or whatever, and that element's lost. And yeah. we, are seeing, we are seeing a fair bit of that. Um, you know, we, we Especially in the black country, massively. where we, there's a lot of organisations, like you said, that those size companies, yeah. micro SME companies, yeah. which like, when the skill base is gone, it's gone. Yeah. But as discussed earlier, I think positive signs this year for take Big on apprentices and, and doing something about it. Yeah, engaging the disengaged. Yeah. So this 2023 barometer is something that we do annually, and it, you know, it's thought leadership, but based on real feedback. And it's not just for income to use, we're making it widely available. We put it on our website, so please go onto our website, click the link, down, download the document. And if you didn't complete or contribute to the questionnaire, then please use some of this thought leadership and analysis and look, look where you can develop in your own business, really, and move forward around the skills agenda and what's happening in training and, and further sectors. Yeah. And, and I'll echo what Gareth just said, th thank you to our customers and clients who've taken the time to, to fill out the barometer. It really helps shape what we do as a business, how we can support industry. And it's been, it's been valuable getting the findings. Yeah, thank you very much.